Well, hey, Foundry Church, it's been a little bit, uh, but it's exciting to be back here. My name's Eric Folkers. I'm one of the pastors here, and um, I'm really excited uh, to step in and, and just uh, share with you what's going on in the Word of God and where we're at in our throne series. Uh, as we are pivoting forward, we're looking at um, today some of what Solomon wrote. It's, it's a pretty tight little piece of scripture, um, but uh, we were on vacation, and whenever we go on vacation, we have this weird thing. I I'm a driver. I love to drive. Erica, thankfully, doesn't like to drive. She's told me if she was rich, one of the things she would have is a driver. Isn't that funny? But to me, I'm like, stay away from the steering wheel. And like, even Josh would be like, do you want me to drive? I'm like, why would I ever want that? I love, I love to drive. And um, <clears throat> with our family vacations, it's always been kind of the practice for me that um, I jump behind the wheel and off we go. And I love to go through the night. Why? Because nobody has to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Nobody wakes up, everybody's asleep, and I get to put like nine straight hours down. Like give everybody some Benadryl deuces, see you in the morning and we're off, I love it. And um, there's been a couple of times where um, I had to figure out what it was, uh, what would keep me awake. I've used Starbucks double shots. A couple of times I did Red Bull, and I would do a Red Bull every few hours to keep me going, because you'll be driving and you're like this, you're like, oh, and you're just trying to stay awake, right? And you're like, slap yourself, hang your head out the window, whatever it takes, catch a June bug in the eye, and then you have to pull over. But um, I love, I love that, that driving through the night. But there is that point where it's just, you're so tired. And you can't do another Red Bull because you're sitting in a seat and your pulse is at 2.30. And you know, it's like, I can't do this anymore. But staying awake at the wheel, well, it just super matters, right? It's an important element to it. And, and I want to kind of frame uh, today's message around that concept, the concept, staying awake at the wheel. What does it mean to stay awake and understand the critical moment we're in? Let's talk for a minute about wisdom. What is wisdom? We all look for advice. Did you know that in 2021, 201,000 people Googled the question, can dogs eat bananas? Isn't that weird? And there's some dog all broke out in hives who's like, no. You know, like, they, but that's the question that was asked out of it. Can dogs eat bananas? And so we go and we, um, and we look for quick answers. We try to get wisdom. But one of the things is that I think is really important is wisdom is more than a quick answer, a quick fact thrown at you that sticks for a minute, but then it kind of melts away and you don't remember what you've learned. Um, un unfortunately, I don't know that in our culture we desire wisdom as much anymore as a quick answer or a quick resolution. We, we desire the quick fix on things, but um, here's the thing. Back in 2002, the term, the verb, remember a verb is an action-oriented word, um, the verb Google, to Google something, was actually nominated for word of the year in 2002. So we're 20 years later, and Google has only increased in its, well, verbiage. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, but Google has increased in its standing. We Google things all the time, all the time. Now we don't just Google things about dogs and bananas. We'll Google things about um, parenting, marriage, friendships, jobs, education. A lot of people... Google things like, does God really exist? We Google things looking for a quick answer and that desire and that, um, that quick turnaround is, is indica it's indicative of a desire for us to get a quick answer, to either solve something or find a quick, quick fix to it, but not do the work that wisdom would have us do, which is a long, slow obedience or learning in the same direction. And I think it's important that we want to um, put more effort in to finding the truth than hitting Google up, which has algorithms to give you answers other people want you to get. Just FYI, Google is not um, this kind of independent thing. There, there are algorithms created by people to get you to answers they hope you find. But the reality is this, um, we need to look and do the work of finding and cultivating wisdom. Finding and cultivating wisdom because in, in our search, in our pursuit of wisdom, we can get very lazy. 
as a species, as a, an American culture, whatever part of these United States you live in or hail out of, even if you're outside of the country, we can be very lazy in the pursuit of it. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. It's going to be the scripture we stay in um, through the day and really work ourselves through. It says this, do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. So let's talk for a minute about this idea of loving sleep. Anybody else love sleep? Oh, gosh, what precious nectar. I love sleep. Um, and, and one of the reasons, like, when you have little kids, sleep is the commodity in life. You're like, you know, you, you ask somebody who has, like, a little baby. You're like, hey, how's it going? They're like, they slept through the night. <laughs> and they're happy and they're kind of crazy. Except Why? Because, well... Sleep is good. But here's the thing I want to do with this. Let's use the love of sleep, the love of getting sleep and, and that, that concept as um, an analogy for laziness. Because though we need sleep, it's not the be all end all of our life. So let's use it as an analogy for this. For some of us, it may pertain to actual sleep. When I was little, I was a big sleeper. I could, I could sleep 20 hours a day. Um, even when I was young, as a young adult, I, I loved to sleep, right? So it's not a bad thing, but I want to use it in this understanding of, of loving sleep. Loving the, the kind of kickback, relaxed mentality, um, the laziness. Someone who doesn't achieve or um, someone, who do, someone who loves sleep will not achieve their goals, and they will not reach the fulfillment of their potential. And potential is not reality. It is saying you have potential to do something great, but potential in and of itself is not greatness. Greatness is achieved not through a love of sleep, not through a laziness, but through a work and a desire to grind and get after it. And some people, because of a love of sleep, Actual physical sleep, because they won't get up on time, will never reach or achieve their goals or fulfill the, the things God had for them. And that is a reality we must look at. Um, we can be at this, at sleep, asleep at the wheel in areas of our life that are catastrophic. What are some areas of our life then where we could be asleep at the wheel and it gets very dangerous? I would say it this way. Our marriages, our jobs, our friendships, maybe as parents, maybe in our Christian faith, we could be asleep at the wheel in these areas and doing incredible damage to not only our life, but the lives around us. And here's the thing. The reason it's dangerous to be asleep at the wheel is because sleep does what? It dulls your senses. It kind of just, you, you, you just, have you ever had it where you just kind of melt into the pillow and your senses and you're just laying there and you're so relaxed? Sleep dulls your senses. There's actually, um, well, when I was young, um, and well, let me say this, when I was younger than I am now, which is all the days before this, um, I would, I've had a dream a few times, a number of times, where uh, something's going on and it's an urgent situation and I remember I can fly. Does anybody else have things like this? Maybe not? Okay, I, I remember I can fly. And so, um, being a child of the 70s, you know, Clark Kent, the, the, great, um, the great Superman movies, and they were great, um, and he like poof, he takes off, and I'll never forget, like in these dreams, I'll be like, okay, I can fly, and I'm like, boom, and I take off, and there's an initial burst, but then I float like a balloon that's more lost most its helium enough that the balloon slowly keeps rising but you're like <laughs> and you're not going anywhere and I'm like why can't I go so I'm like you know I'm, I'm I basically look like I'm having leg cramps in the sky I'm like kind of twitching and trying to fly harder and I can't there's people who uh fall asleep and um they will be awake mentally, but their body isn't awake because there's certain stages of sleep where your physical body um, is, is, is paralyzed. 
So if you've ever had a dream where you're trying to run fast and you're like, like that, and you're wondering why is that? It's because your physical body cannot respond to the impulses of your brain. And your brain's saying run, but you physically cannot run. You're, you're in a stage of sleep that, that causes a state of paralysis. Isn't that interesting? So being asleep can dull our senses and cause us to actually be paralyzed from acting. And when you're asleep at the wheel in your marriage, your friendships, your work, your parenting, or your Christian faith, I would say this. You don't want to be in those positions asleep at the wheel. You want to be nimble, awake, and alert because it matters when life happens that you're able to respond to it. We do not want to be coasting through this life, loving sleep more than we should. We shouldn't love laziness in any way. We should be awake, alert, and fully aware. And some of our vital responses need to be keenly alert for um, an opportunity not only to share the gospel, to be a better husband, wife, parent, friend, whatever your role may be at that time. When we don't act when we should, quite often it's because we weren't, well, we were asleep at the wheel in our life and we weren't looking at the opportunities down the road that are coming to us. And what it leads to is poverty. A love of sleep leads to poverty. What does it say again? Do not love sleep or you will grow poor. Stay awake and you will have food to spare. Stay awake at the wheel of your life and you'll have food to spare. Poverty is a direct result of our love of sleep, of our laziness. Now here's the thing. There is... um, practical application to this proverb. If you love sleep and you don't get up for work, you're not going to go and get paid. Your bills are going to pile up and you're going to get, you know, foreclosed, whatever goes on in that. If you love sleep, if you're lazy and you don't get up and engage life, that's going to happen. But if we use this idea um, and we we kind of pivot back to the idea of being asleep at the wheel in our life, um, we can ask the question, what other forms of poverty are going to overtake us? What other ways will poverty get into our life and do a work that is negative in its transformational capacity? So let's take a look at that. Because in physical poverty... There are factors that contribute to financial poverty that are out of our control. There are factors that, well, here's some of them. The, maybe your upbringing. Maybe you were raised in a home that had a dysfunctional relationship with finances, um, either too little or a worship of it. I don't know, but, but your relationship with money and your upbringing um, changed something in you that, that kind of set you on a course to live in poverty. Maybe there was no opportunities given to you. Maybe the opportunities you wanted to reach for weren't there. Opportunities that are readily available to other people were not presented to you, or just the general infrastructure of our government right now that is, um, that is contributing mightily to the impoverishing of its people. We look at this and realize there are things beyond our control when it comes to financial poverty, but there are simple factors that do contribute to our own poverty in financial ways. And um, there are really two things, work ethic, work ethic super matters, and savings. The ability to live within your means. So when we look at this and understand that, um, that work ethic, you're, you, look, I, I'm an employer at, at this church. I work and, and I work and I, I wouldn't say manage, but I work with other employees. When you're a worker, there is a love for you in my heart that is overwhelming. When I know that if I hit your number, you answer, you're like, hey, what's up? And there's not a, oh, hey, but there's, there's an excitement. As, as an employer, work ethic weighs so much. And there are, there are parts of our culture right now are like, oh, don't try so hard and different things. I will tell you this. I think it's important that we work hard, that we pour our best into it, especially when we don't feel it. Because when we feel it, it comes naturally. But when we don't feel it and we lean in, our work ethic rises and you will be rewarded as an employee. I can tell you that if you've got high work ethic, you're going to be vertically mobile in the organization you're in and the ability to save and live within your means. That matters and that will contribute to you not being in poverty. But here's the thing, the same is true in our own homes. 
There is a poverty that is not related to our finances. There is a poverty in relationships. We can be people who are lazy in our relationships and we take, take, take and it hurts people and it's, it's unhealthy and it's, it's wounding to be. Actually, I would say this, it's abusive in its nature because what it does is it takes for your benefit at the expense of someone you are called to care for and love. So when you look at this and see that relational poverty takes place in our home, in our marriages, in our children, in our friends, we need to look at that and realize the effect it can have. When you have a parent who only takes from their children and never invests and pours into them and demands of them to be something that the parent should be instead of the child, it is an abusive thing that impoverishes the child. It breaks the ethic in their mind of what a mom or a dad is supposed to be. And so we look at this understanding that there are situations and factors that impact our relational poverty. And they change our relationships. And yes, some of them are out of our control. Some of them have happened to you and it needs to be known and named. It needs to be named that um, there are relationships that have taken from you and hurt you. You have, you have experienced things that are not your fault. But as an adult, as someone who is um, able to gain wisdom and grow and learn, it is now your responsibility to step into relational healthy ways and ways that do not impoverish those around you in your marriage, in your children, in your friendships. If you're a, so I don't know if you know what this is, but um, there's sharks. If you ever, I love Shark Week. Anybody else? Isn't it close to Shark Week? I think it's close to Shark Week. Um, Nat Geo Shark Week, always amazing. Um, but you see a great white swimming along and he's just meandering along and he's so big and buff and awesome. He's gonna eat something and you're so excited about it. And around them are these little things called remoras. And remoras hang around bigger fish. And when the great white shark tears something to horrible pieces and blood fills the water, the remora's like, yes, dinner time. The remora does no work. All it does is keep up with the bigger fish. All it does is leech off the work of someone else. If, if you're looking at your life relationally and all you do is pull from people, there's a poverty in that. And not only are you impoverished relationally, you're pulling from other people and you are impoverishing them. And so that brokenness needs to be addressed. So let's look at a couple of things that are in your control that you as a Christian who is seeking wisdom can do to not live in that kind of poverty. Hard work. Hard work relationally. In a marriage um, I learn this, I feel like, all the time. I know Erica learns this. She, will, she does things that she watches me or she hears me say, and then she goes and, um, and like does something kind based off what I've said. And she doesn't have to do that, but she hears it, knows I value it, and so she does that on my behalf. And I'm learning, as a husband, I can be selfish in that way. I can, I can, I have not always listened well and been intuitive and kind and loving. I'm like, man, what a doorknob I am. It's been an example to me. And I see that and I'm like, that is really, um, that it's hard work to listen to what someone has and then take the risk of trying to, to, to meet that desire in them. You could fail. But relationships, good relationships, marriages, children, parenting, it's hard work. It's hard work. I will tell you, like, I, I, I will not quit beating this drum. Parents, read the data on social media. It is killing a generation. It is harder work to say no to it than to be like, fine, I'm tired of you always in my ear about it. It's not easy. And it does isolate your child in some ways. And they're going to lean more into you because they don't have a social network that they can constantly be on. But I will tell you this, that hard work will pay dividends. It's hard to not say yes to everything. But in wisdom, we look and go, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't live like emotional trust fund babies. Have you ever met a trust funder? 
like someone who has a trust fund and it's set up and they know at some point in their life for no other reason than who they were related to, they're gonna come into seven or eight figures one day and their life, they don't have to work hard because they're a trust fund baby, right? And I'm not against that. Like, like, that's great. Somebody worked hard and has given that gift. That's awesome. But here's the thing. It can affect someone's motivation and willingness to do hard work. I would say this. A trust fund Baby, a trust fund baby emotionally is someone who thinks they have an endless well to draw out of other people with. They can constantly take and never give back in because they think it's an inexhaustible sum of emotional energy that they can pull out of other people or take from other people. Or they can take other people's time, treasure, and talent and that there's no expense to them for it. And here's the reality. We need to do harder work as the church in our relational investments, in our marriages, in our parenting, in our friendships. We need to be willing to do the hard thing, not just the fun thing. And as a leader, it is lonely at times. And it is hard. But when you do that, you know this. You know that there's someone who will never lie to you. And you know that there's someone who actually cares about who you are, not what you do for them. Not what you do for them. And that, like, how good is that? We live in a society that tells us if you don't do these things, you're not valuable. And the gospel speaks the other way. It says you're valuable because of who made you. And because God made them too, you should be pouring value into their life and doing that. So when we look at this, we should do hard work in this. We should do hard work in our relationships. We should listen to our spouses and take the risks and and make an effort to show them that they're seen, that they're heard, that they're valued. We should do that with our children and give them boundaries and give them love and affirmation. We shouldn't give them a trophy for everything they do. I have three kids. They don't deserve trophies for everything they do, but they do some amazing things. And the things that matter, I'm going to celebrate. And the things that don't, like, okay, that's all right, but I'm not giving you a trophy for it. Good parenting isn't always easy. It's hard work. Good friendships, not always easy. It's hard work. But the reality is it pays dividends. It's an investment into their life, not a withdrawal. And I think that's important that we as Christians remember we are people who make investments into other people's lives, right? We make investments into people so that they don't live in poverty. So where is the relational uh, poverty that we have stemming from as far as you're in control? Is it a lack of work? Is it a lack of investment of your time? And I love that phrase that says this. Love is spelled T-I-M-E, like the time we spend tells, tells our family what we love. So we look at that and recognize that, that maybe we haven't put the work in and we haven't put the time in. So where is your relational poverty stemming from? Here's a scripture out of 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verse 8. It says it this way. Be on your guard. And stay awake. Be on your guard and stay awake. Your enemy, the devil, is is like a roaring lion sneaking around for someone to attack, someone to devour. The word, the Greek word in that is to consume, to destroy and consume. What does people always say with sin? It like it consumes them. The devil is a roaring lion and he's always lurking for someone to consume. Stay awake. We said that at the beginning, stay awake. Don't fall asleep at the wheel. One year, uh, we went to Boston. What year was that? I don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah, four or five years ago. It was awesome. I love Boston. Went to the Kennedy Presidential Museum. I always love going to presidential museums. Went out, like, went to Cape Cod. Went to Hyannis Port, which is how the Kennedys said it, and I felt cool saying it. Um, But uh, actually, I was restricted from saying Hyannis Port anymore because everybody's like, stop, you're weird. And I just thought it was cool. Um, But we went and we did the Beantown Upright. We had a great time in Boston. But on our way there, we did what I love to do. We got in the car. Um... It was uh, late afternoon, early evening, and we bolted east, right? We headed east. And uh, it was before COVID, so we went up over past Toronto, and we dropped into northern New York, and we were heading down. We got to uh, Connecticut, and uh, the sun, it wasn't quite, like, the sky was just starting to change a little, and I was like, 
I can't do it. I can't stay awake. So we pulled off. Um, everybody was asleep. Actually, Erica had stayed up with me because she knew I was super tired. And she's like, why don't we just pull over and get like 30 minutes, you know, just, you know, get five winks. <laughs> Made me sound old. And, um, and uh, just, just a short little power nap and then we'll get on there. I'm like, perfect. Because we were way ahead of schedule, which is always my goal, to beat Google Maps. And um, so we pull off and we're at a rest stop. Kids are, kids are just in the back, just like, you know, cashed out. And so for me, I have a magic ability. I'm like, I think I want to go to, and I'm out. I just fall right asleep. And uh, so we, we get in there. I tilt my chair back, and I go right to sleep. And I hear my wife, and when Erica kind of gasps, it just, it wakes me up. And she goes, somebody's at the car. I mean, everything in me is like, and I'm like looking around. And there are two dudes walking around our car, and one is looking in through um, the front windshield. And, and, you know, I have a problem with fight or flight, and I'm like, hey, dude, what are you doing? Because our windows were cracked. Otherwise, it gets all fogged up and weird. And, um, and it smells like mouth bath. And it, so we had our windows down a little. And, um, and I'm like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, oh, oh you know. But, but I will tell you this, like the idea, the feeling that someone was lurking around my car and my family, what would you do? What would you do if, if you're asleep and you wake up and someone's lurking around your house? I am not okay with it. I'm like, no, that's my family. I'm going to protect it at all costs. And I went straight fight or flight. I was like, I super engaged right away. And then Erica just said, well, let's leave. At this point, my pulse is like 380. And I'm like, you know, because I'm, I'm just so wildly awake. And I'm like, well, looks like we're going to Boston. And we back out and we take off. I had no problem staying awake after that. We get to Boston in record time with no sleep. Why? Because we recognized there was a point at which we saw the reality of someone lurking around our car and when we think of the devil we often like you know I don't think any one of us has ever had a lion lurk around us it's probably not happened and if it has it's weird it's just not normal for Americans to get lurked by a lion um but here's the thing there is an enemy of your soul and he he walks around like someone seeking to get in, steal, destroy, and consume your life, like those people around our car. And we should have a visceral response to it. Keep yourself awake. Peter says it. Be on your guard and stay awake. Stay awake. Be alert because there is an enemy to your soul that wants to destroy it. And just, you know, we love to Google things in our, in our society. But what if we look back at just this past week, in our devotions. Let me walk you through what we have talked about through the daily devotions this past week. It'll tell you maybe this of how you can keep yourself awake spiritually. How do you stay awake spiritually? How can you stockpile wisdom now so that when you need it, there's a reservoir to draw from? The first thing is, we talked about marriage and sex in the Song of Songs with Solomon talked about that. We talked about balance between workplace and home, Psalm 127. Knowing what, uh, what kind of goals matter in life, Psalm 127. How to relate to the Lord, Proverbs 1 to 5, 1 through 5. Um, how to avoid sin, Proverbs 6 through 10. Uh, how to deal with worry, Proverbs 11 to 15. Being, good fr- being a good friend, Proverbs 11 to 15. That's just one week. That's one week of devotions. When we say to you, be in the word of God, it's because the word of God speaks into everyday issues. It speaks to the things that matters. You could have have been storing up wisdom throughout this week. And here's the thing. You don't need a dump truck of wisdom. You need a spoonful at a time, enough to digest, enough to get into you. And there was enough spoonfuls in this week to draw a reservoir of wisdom out of you in times of crisis. That's one week of devotion where you could have been leaning into all those things. So I would encourage you and remind you that to store wisdom, we have to go to the source of it. Maybe we should consider Googling things less and maybe Bibling a little bit more. Google will get you the quick answer. Remember, an algorithm that somebody else wants you to find certain answers to. And what will scripture do? It'll tell you what's on God's heart. It'll tell you what God's thinking on certain things. 
So maybe we should get into a little bit more of a biblical mindset and less of a Google mindset when it comes to this. Out of 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, um, it says this uh, regarding Scripture, because you may think, okay, Eric, but Google has the answers to everything. I will tell you this, everything in Scripture trumps anything Google has. Everything in Scripture is this, and it says this out of uh, 2 Timothy 3, 3, 16. Everything. In the scripture is God's word, all of it useful for teaching and helping people, for correcting them and showing them how to live, how to live, how to stay awake, stay alert, value what matters and have healthy priorities. And in the end, what will it do? What does it say in the second half of that scripture out of Proverbs? It says this, stay awake and you will have food to spare. So let's talk about food to spare. At the end of today's proverb, we look at this concept of having an abundance, an abundance of something, food to spare. If we don't fall asleep at the wheel in our life, there will be some measure of abundance. If we stay alert, we will not only have enough, we'll have enough to share, we'll have enough to give, we will be able, we'll have enough to share and enough to spare. Oh, I like that. I just came up with it on my own. Um, But here's the thing, Um, your home won't suffer because you're devoted to work at times. Your work won't suffer because you're a devoted husband, wife, parent, whatever. You will stay awake and alert and your priorities will find alignment in God's word and you will have enough to share in your life. There will be margin in your existence. So I think it's important that we do this. Your office won't only be a healthy work environment for you, but it'll be healthy for those who work with you. There'll be challenge, there'll be correction, there'll be encouragement, and there'll be opportunity just thrown out there because you are someone living in God's order, not this world's order. Your marriage won't just bless you and your spouse, but it'll bless your children for generations. It'll bless other marriages around you as an example of what God called marriage to be, a service to one another, seeking the other's benefit and best, not what you can get from them, a selfish life, is a lazy life, my friends. It is a life dead asleep at the wheel. It is all consumed inward, right? Have you ever seen someone driving down the road and they're looking in the mirror and they're like, and you're like, oh my gosh, look at the road. Or you see someone on their phone, super makes me mad every time I see it. Because you look and you're like, you're hurtling down the road. Look up. Look up because we're around you. When I, when I say that, spiritually, emotionally, physically, church, wake up in the life you're living. It's not a given. It can end and will, and it could end sooner than we think. So what we need to do is wake up because a selfish life, constantly gazing at oneself, is um, a lazy But here's the other thing, miserable life. I do not know a person who is selfish, who is happy. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people. But a self-absorbed, selfish person is miserable. Miserable. Because everything relates to whether they won or lost. Even in winning, now they have more to lose. It's, It's a miserable existence. So, let me ask you a question. Where are you loving sleep a little too much? Where are you being lazy in your life that God needs to correct? Where are you asleep at the wheel in your life? It could be how you work. It could be in your marriage, your home, your friendships, your spiritual life. I mean, friends, oh man, the spiritual life of Christ is a life of becoming a disciple, not just getting out of hell. Where are you asleep at the wheel? How are you going to wake up? Hopefully in some way, this is one of those things that wakes you. The other night, quick story to wrap up, um, my, I'm laying in bed, and I'm a jumpy sleeper. I, I twitch in my sleep, but that's a different thing. Um, but my kids know, go, go to mom. Do not come to me. The other night, Ethan walks into our room, and he's, he told me this yesterday. He just went to put his hand on me, and I come out of bed, like, ready to hit him, and he, like, jumps back, and he's like, it's me! And I was like, I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't want to punch you, but go to your mom. Like, go, go talk to her. She's not going to whack you when you wake her up. But here's the thing. How are you going to wake up? What is it going to take to get you out of your sleep? If this word causes you to jump and flinch and be like, wait a minute, where am, I, where am I asleep at the wheel? Then wake up 
And don't just react to something. Take a minute and seek God's wisdom on how to respond to thing, things. What is your plan? What plan are you going to set in place to work hard in relationships, in life, in everything? What's your first plan? Set one step and begin yourself into the motion of obedience. And where will you invest? Where will you pour into and not receive? Where will you pay into something that will never pay you back? That is part of the Christian faith. Remember, these things, returns take time. Every investor will tell you so. Expecting immediate results is the laziness of our culture. It's short-sighted, self-motivated. It's the same as expecting wisdom from Google. Maybe we should get our eyes on goals that are created by God and not ourselves. Pray with me. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for um, the challenge of your word. And I pray, God, that you would wake us up, that you would shake us out of our slumber, and we would respond in obedience and, um, and joy and thankfulness to you. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus, who modeled for us a life of pouring oneself out for those, maybe, Lord, that we weren't born yet when Christ died for us, but we were on your heart. So God, may we invest relationally, emotionally in all that we do for those we don't know yet, for those we don't see, for the harvest yet to come. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.